My friend, Andrea Carter Brown, author of the book of poems, The Disheveled Bed, has written elegantly about her experiences of 9-11 from the point of view of a poet writing in her apartment two blocks south of the World Trade Center when the towers fell. Working on a book of poems in her study, then fleeing her home, carrying nothing but the clothes she was wearing, coughing and running through choking dust rolling out of the sky like a great avalanche down high-rise canyons, wondering where her husband was, if he was still alive, and finding him, then remembering she'd left her poetry manuscript and laptop behind. Forced to lie to police days later that she was worried about her cat in her apartment, a lie to save something almost as precious, she returned to retrieve her laptop and the manuscript, a stack of paper lying buried under fine gray dust like snow. How could she write about what had happened to her, she wondered for years especially when the events had so traumatized her that she could barely think about any of it, moving away from New York City to L.A. just to forget. For years, it just hurt too much to remember. Then later, when she'd gotten some distance from the public and private story, both geographically, psychologically, and emotionally, she began to ask herself how she could write about it honestly without borrowing emotion from the event, and yes, without re-experiencing and recreating what amounted to a severe case of post-traumatic stress so vividly that she might actually lose her mind. But maybe the risk was worth it, she told me one night over sushi in Vancouver. Maybe she could create something altogether new about that terrible public tragedy, and maybe, just maybe, help to heal herself and others too. Should she write a memoir, she asked me, or another book of poems? What do you want to write, I asked her. What do you have to write? Eventually she chose poetry. When public tragedies become personal, the public events themselves lend credence to our own personal stories. One person speaking is a kind of spokesperson for all those affected. And we as writers feel an obligation to speak for others when we can do so with authenticity, honesty, and a great sense of craft. The story of Maxine Hong Kingston's book, The Fifth Book of Peace, similar in some ways to the story of Andrea Carter Brown, is a particularly ironic and fascinating example, especially for writers. When returning from her father's funeral in 1991, Kingston, author of the celebrated book The Women Warrior, Memoirs of a Girlhood Among Ghosts, saw smoke rising from the hills of Oakland and Berkeley where she lived, then flickers of bright flame, a firestorm spreading across her drought-dry neighborhood. She'd been working on a novel, the fourth book of peace, based on ancient Chinese texts, and her manuscript was sitting on her desk in her study, over 150 good pages, she told a group of people at a reading I attended once. She rushed her up her street, but police stopped her at a roadblock. I have a book, she tried to explain. It's taken me years to write, but the police turned her away. Then she spotted a man on a bicycle and asked him where he was going. Up there, he said. Take me with you, she said, and she rode on the bicycle ha handles up the hill until she saw the smoldering ruins of her home, just a blackened chimney sticking up from the rubble. Later she found the manuscript, a stack of crackling black flakes that crumbled in her hands. The only thing that survived the fire in her study, sitting in the ashes next to her melted computer and hard drive, she said, was a smiling clay Buddha. She tried to remember what she'd written by hiring a graduate student who was also a hypnotist, tried to imagine scrolling through her computer screen, but no luck. She tried to rewrite the book as she'd written it, but it was lost forever, like the ancient first, second, and third books of peace, all burned in a fire. Finally, grief-stricken, she began another book, a new book a memoir whose first chapter would begin with this story and a ride on bicycle handles through a burning neighborhood, the fifth book of peace. As with my friend Andrea Carter Brown and her experiences of 9-11, it may take years to write about events we experience with others as a kind of public gestalt. The facts already established for most it's our task mostly to write about what happened to us, doing our best to tell the emotional and factual truth without exaggeration, and to understate what we write in the most dramatic moments to avoid melodrama or any sense that we're borrowing emotions from the events that we're writing about. 
overstating or relying too heavily on the need to portray ourselves or others as victims. And make no mistake, there are very real victims, people whose stories must be told in as truthful and understated a way as possible. In fact, paradoxically, the more we understate such stories, whether they are others or our own, the more likely readers will experience those motions for us. Let the reader not the character emote, one of my teachers, novelist William Harrison, once said. I think he was right, though in our efforts to avoid the sentimental, we're always in danger of making ourselves or the people we write about seem unemotional or even cold. Worse, we may avoid risking emotion altogether. Genuine victims must also face another dilemma. When there's no public record of our own sometimes very private events, when we have no witnesses except perhaps perpetrators, when other witnesses can't or won't remember, or even when they deny or dismiss our experiences or, or our emotions altogether, the writing of memoir can become full of internal and external obstacles we must overcome, the truest act of bravery. In a very real sense, we must give ourselves permission to tell our own stories unflinchingly, willing to face our deepest shame and our greatest fears, to move on from victimhood to a larger sense of power, a real sense of victory over the darkest moments in our lives that have the potential to enslave us. No writer illustrates this kind of courage better than Sue William Silverman. Sexually abused by her father from the time she was a young girl, then afflicted with sexual addiction for much of her young adult life, she managed to write about both with remarkable clarity and insight in her groundbreaking memoirs because I remember Terror Father, I Remember You, and Love Sick. Her book, Fearless Confessions, A Writer's Guide to Memoir, is not just a guide for others wishing to write about their own personal demons and terrors, but a celebration of the healing power we may regain by facing the truth about our lives, even when and perhaps because others have tried to silence us. Unfortunately, perhaps because of the seemingly sensational nature of memoirs like Sue Silverman's and others, some hold the mistaken notion that creative nonfiction must recount only the most secret, tawdry, and melodramatic personal events in one's life, sexual abuse, drug abuse, and the like. In fact, critics, rightly or wrongly, have dismissed so-called confessional writing for as long as people have been writing such stories as in the backlash against such confessional poets as Sylvia Plath and Anne Sexton, whose work ultimately survived such attacks and has even become a part of the contemporary canon. It's unseemly to go around talking so openly about one's secret, such critics seem to say. Writers should behave themselves and not give way to such undignified emotionalism. For me, anyway, such critics themselves doth seem to protest too much ultimately reinforcing the kinds of unspoken rules about keeping secrets that keep families and nations dysfunctional, creating the very situations in which writers feel silenced and powerless. Should we risk writing about those who've wounded us in the past, or about those we may ourselves have wounded? Yes, absolutely. One of my former teachers, the late great novelist poet Jim Whitehead, once told a workshop I was taking from him, we write from the wound. It's all right to be wounded. It's what we sing about. I like that. The question for me isn't at all whether we should write about the wound or our woundedness or whatever you want to call it. That's a given. But how we tell our stories while also adhering to the highest standards of artistic and journalistic integrity, finding empathy even for those whom we may not consider in any way heroic or admirable. Silverman was willing and no doubt remarkably brave to address her perpetrator, her own father, directly by name. But even in the case of James Fry, the question arises whether we should identify perpetrators or victims at all, or try to hide their identities by changing names, places, or facts, even in creative nonfiction. I don't have any simple answers to these questions. I don't think anyone does. Though I do take some encouragement and even courage from a story like Pat Conroy's novel, The Great Santini. Conroy wrote the novel in part to hide his own and his father's identities, though when his father read the thinly disguised autobiography, he must have known who his son was really writing about. Strikingly, though, when he saw the film adaptation of the book with Robert Duvall in the leading role of the father, Conroy's father clung to the notion that he, the father, was in fact the hero of the novel and the movie. 
one can only laugh at such cluelessness. <laughs> it's small comfort, I admit, but people who didn't get it in the past usually don't get it now either. In that sense, at least, perhaps we're all safe to tell the truth about our lives in creative nonfiction. Ultimately, though, only the writer can make such a difficult and courageous choice. Writing about real people, of course, has real consequences. The last thing we want to do is simply to write as an act of vengeance or to harm those who might have done us harm. We might inadvertently do harm to those who, perhaps like us, may have already been victimized before. As therapeutic and healing as such writing may be, we must also move beyond simplistic villain-victim dualities and really try to understand others, even those who may have done us harm. Discovering their humanity and our own may be our greatest goal, requiring remarkable levels of empathy, if not outright forgiveness. What do I mean exactly by this often misunderstood or misrepresented word empathy? I'm referring primarily to a writer's narrative stance. Ask anyone with a disability and a great personal dignity if she needs help, and she might bite one's nose off. The reason? If one's stance is even slightly patronizing, looking down one's nose literally or figuratively, showing the slightest edge of so-called sympathy or worse, pity, the person receiving such patronizing talk has every right to be angry. Sympathy is the kind of thing one might find inside a Hallmark card, smarmy and sentimental, and pity, at least from my point of view, is perhaps the most negative emotion one can show toward another, an attitude that suggests we believe we are somehow superior to that person. Empathy, on the other hand, is an acknowledgment of equality, a sign of mutual respect, the ability to put ourselves imaginatively into another's place and to begin there, if that's even possible. From this narrative stance, a writer can identify with, or at least try to identify with, almost anyone. One's self to avoid self-pity, or even someone whom we most would consider a perpetrator or a villain, to try to move towards understanding. This point is often misunderstood in a political context, too. Those on the right argue that such empathy somehow excuses the behavior of those who do harm, sometimes terrible harm. I don't agree. Even the most heinous perpetrator of a crime is human on some level, and it's our job, if possible, to find that humanity. If we fail, we fail to acknowledge what Hannah Arendt called the banality of evil, that evil is as ordinary as you and I, and its face is sometimes as bland as a shopkeeper's. It's true that some people, sociopaths, psychopaths, and serial killers themselves, have no empathy. And because of this fact, they all seem wired differently than the rest of us. All the more reason to understand them and the nature of evil, if that's even possible. A serial killer known as Ivan the Terrible murdered several children and ate their body parts in a Moscow park during the 80s, an inconceivable and unspeakable crime until we find out his history. A survival of Hitler's siege of Stalingrad, freezing and starving to death, surrounded by Nazi troops and the frozen corpses of other people, including his own siblings. Like the Donner Party stranded, party stranded in the winter of 1846 in the Sierra Nevada, he was forced into cannibalism simply to survive. And somehow that terrible trauma stayed with him till through a kind of repetition compulsion he turned into a monster. If we explore the depths of such people, we may understand their motives, conscious or unconscious, better, even we, when we may not excuse it. And for me, all good fiction, creative nonfiction and drama, are ultimately explorations of motive, why human beings might do the things that they do.